Well, today we're going to talk about the danger of disappointment. The danger of disappointment. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 26. So if you have your Bibles here today, you guys can go ahead and turn there. But let's just be honest, we're probably going to look at the screens. All right. (laughs) And so we're going to be in Matthew 26. We're going to read a pretty large portion of scripture this morning. So I hope that's okay. And I'm not asking for permission. I'm just telling you that's what we're going to do. Amen. Because some of you, maybe this is the first time you've read the Bible in seven days. And so we're going to be in Matthew 26 and we're going to read a large portion. But I think there's, it's important to see the progression that takes place in this passage. And so I want to read all of it so we can get a, an idea of what's taking place and then We're going to break it down a little bit. So um, Matthew 26, say ready if you're ready. All right. All right. It says this starting in verse 31. It says, then Jesus told them this very night you will fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I never will. Lord, what are you talking about? I never will. And Jesus said, truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, this time he declared, he declared, even if all have, even if I have to die with you, I will What's that word? Never. You know you've said never about some things in your life. We've all said never in our lives. We've all said never before. Be careful what you say never about. Be careful what you say never about. When I know when I was growing up, and I'm just going to take a moment here really quick to tell you. Uh, growing up, my dad's a pastor. Some of you have met him. He's been here before. Um, and he's going to be watching this. And so I love sharing stories like this because I know he's going to be watching this this week when it goes on YouTube. And so when growing up, people would always ask me, they're like, hey, are you going to be a pastor like your dad? And, and growing up as a teenager, it's like, no, <laughs> no. In fact, I wanted to be everything that was the opposite of who he was. <laughs> you know, so it's like, hey, you're going to be a pastor when you grow up? No, I'm never going to be a pastor. God has a sense of humor. (laughs) Amen. God has a sense of humor. And so be careful what you say never about, because you'll end up right there. Amen. I I love this. You hear people sometimes, they'll say, well, when I have kids, my kids will never behave that way. (laughs) I probably said that too, until I had a little three-year-old running around back talking to me, you know, it's a different story when they come along. I mean, my kids are never going to behave that way. Well, it, be, be careful. Your sins will find you out. Amen. And so uh, I'll, I'll never let my kids behave that way or I'll never get a divorce. I'll never go into debt. I'll never deny you, Lord. That's what Peter said. Be careful what you say, never about. Let's keep reading. Verse 36, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. So Jesus leaves those three disciples there and he presses on a little further. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour he asked Peter, 
he asked Peter that question. He was addressing all the disciples, those, those three that were right there. But he's locked eyes with Peter. He's talking to Peter because Peter is the leader. He's the leader. So he asked Peter, couldn't you men keep watch with me for just one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, my father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them. He left them. He didn't wake them up this time. He said, just sleep. It's crazy how sometimes God will leave you if you don't listen. He left them where they were. Now, he didn't leave them or forsake them, you know. That's what the, the promise of God's word says. But he did leave them. If, if they were going to sleep, he needed to teach them a lesson. So he left them. He let them sleep. And he went away once more and prayed the third time, this time by himself, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. So here's Peter, because that's, that's who we're honing in on. That's who we're focusing on today. Here's Peter having just probably a few hours ago told Jesus, when Jesus told him that he was gonna deny him, when, when, when Jesus told him, hey, be careful what you say never about, because later tonight you're gonna deny me three times. And so here's Peter, knowing what Jesus has already told him was gonna happen, and he would rather sleep than pray and prepare for what was coming. And what I think is ironic about this situation as you see it unfold in, in the scripture, we're going to keep reading here in just a moment, but pause because I think this is very important for us as we, as we go forward here. At the same time that Jesus and his disciples are coming into the garden on this side, the enemy was coming in, Judas was coming in on the other side. And I think it's, it's important to pay attention to this because it's crazy to me how we will get up in the morning and we'll open our Bible and we'll blow through our quiet time just to make it another item on our checklist when all the time the devil's waiting for you when you get to work. And Jesus tried to tell Peter, go over here with me and watch and pray because you have no idea what is coming. But Peter, thinking he had it all figured out, thinking that he knew what was gonna happen, that he thought he was tough stuff, he, he thought he knew how this was gonna play out, he just decided to sleep his way through it. And I think it's crazy, we do the same thing with our spiritual lives. We blow right through it like it's just another thing to do. We show up on Sunday because it's just a thing to do. It's what we do every week and we sit here in the room and, and we get distracted so many times just thinking about, hey, where am I gonna go for lunch afterwards? And we can't even focus in on what God's trying to say us because tomorrow morning when you wake up, all hell's gonna break loose. And in this moment, God's saying, watch and pray and prepare because you have no idea what's coming. And it's crazy because even right now there's people either watching this online or you're here in the room and the devil is distracting you so much by that device that's in your hand that notifications keep popping up and you just keep clicking on it. And we wonder why during the week the devil just wreaks havoc in our lives. Wake up, wake up. That's what Jesus is trying to tell his disciples, wake up. Because at the same time they came into the garden, the devil was coming in on the other side. And the devil had a plan too. So wake up. I believe this, if Peter would have spent just as much time preparing as he did declaring, what happened next probably could have been avoided. Verse 47. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12 arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. 
Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kissed is the man. Arrest him. I feel like they knew who Jesus was, but still we needed a signal, okay? And so he said, the man I kissed is the one that you need to arrest. So going at once Jesus, going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus replied, do you what you came for, friend? He still called him friend. Mm. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions, we know from John's account of this story in his gospel that this was Peter. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Peter was ready. He thought this was it. It's going down. But I don't know about you, but I don't feel like Peter was very good with the sword. <laughs> He missed, cut off his ear. And then Jesus said this. He said, put your sword back in its place. Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Imagine Peter's disappointment when Jesus said that. Hey, I know you think it's going to play out one way, but it's got to happen this way. Imagine the disappointment that Peter felt in that moment. Embarrassment probably too, because he thought he knew how it was going to play out. He thought he knew what was going to go down, but Jesus said, nope. It's got to happen this way. In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, I, am I leading a rebellion that you have come to me with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you didn't arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. And here it is. But Peter followed him at a distance. Peter followed him at a distance. See, there's a shift. There's a shift that happens. This is the same Peter that a few hours ago, I'll never, I'll never disown you. I'll never deny you. And here he is. He's at a distance from his Savior. See, disappointment will lead to distance. Disappointment will lead to distance. Disappointment is dangerous because we're going to see a progression here that happens to Peter. His disappointment is leading to distance. And the distance led to what happens next. Let's skip down to verse 69. We're almost there. Bear with me. Now, Peter was sitting out in the courtyard. So Jesus has been taken away. He's at the high priest, Caiaphas. And they're putting him on trial. And outside, Peter's sitting in the courtyard. And a servant girl came over to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl, notice now he's getting further away. Now he's getting further away. He's trying to distance himself from the one that disappointed him. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you Away. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. I know that seems like a lot. <laughs> I know that seems like a lot, but there's a progression that takes place. And the progression is this, and this is the danger of disappointment, and I want us to see this today. 
That disappointment led to distance, and then distance led to denial. That's what happened to Peter. And you could probably tack another D on there if you wanted to, if you wanted to be clever enough and say it started with him declaring, Lord, I'll never, I'll never disown you. I'll never leave you. I'll never walk away. I'll never. Because he thought he had it figured out. He thought he knew what was gonna happen. He had certain expectations of of what was gonna happen. He had certain expectations on Jesus, but then Jesus disappointed him. (laughs) And then Peter stepped back and he put distance between him and Jesus. And then it ultimately led to him denying him altogether. See, notice that the title of the message is not, hey, here's three steps to avoid disappointment. I wish there was three steps. I wish there was three steps, but disappointment is inevitable. It's a part of life. It's, it's, it happens. It happens to all of us. And so the the point is not, hey, how can we avoid disappointment? But here's what I want us to see today. What's important is how we process that disappointment. We can't avoid it. We have to accept it. It will happen. Some of you are disappointed right now. Maybe you're disappointed that Richie's not preaching. But God's got something for you today, even in, if that is your disappointment, God's got something for you today. We can't avoid it, we have to accept it. But here's the main point of today, it's how we process that disappointment. Because how we process disappointment will determine whether it's fear that paralyzes us, or faith that propels us. Is it gonna be fear that paralyzes you where you are when you're disappointed? Are you gonna let faith fuel you? Let faith propel you forward? See, we all face disappointment. It's it's just a part of life. It's what happens. Maybe, Maybe you had high expectations of a spouse and they just let you down in the first five minutes of being married because it happens, it happens. Maybe you have high expectations of your church or your pastors. Can I let you in on a secret? We're not perfect. We're not perfect. We lead a church and one of our value statements is we're the perfect place for imperfect people. None of us are perfect. I've talked to people before and they're like, man, if I could just find the perfect church. And I like to tell them, man, if you ever find it, don't join it because you'll mess it up, because you're not perfect. I'm not perfect, we're not perfect. We're the perfect place for imperfect people. We're the perfect place for imperfect people. We're gonna disappoint each other. We're gonna let each other down. We're not perfect. And things happen in life that just don't play out the way we want it to play out. Maybe, maybe you had expectations of a, a certain job. Maybe you, you, you did the application, you did the interview process, you did all the things you were supposed to do, and then when it came down to it, they picked somebody else and you didn't get it. Disappointment. But what do you do with it? What do you do with it? You can't avoid it, it's gonna happen, just accept it. But what do you do with it? When when Christina and I were preparing um, before we came down here, we did a lot of interviewing ourselves at different churches and we faced a lot of disappointment during that season, but God taught us a lot. He grew us a lot. And there was one church in Charleston, South Carolina we, we interviewed at. We had lots of meetings with the pastors there over the phone and over video. And then we made some trips there and just fell in love with the opportunity We were super excited about it, loved the people there, loved the church. We came back and they told me, hey, this is what the job is. This is how much we pay. What do you think? And so we were like, hey, let us pray about it. Let's talk about it. And then I told them, I said, hey, we're we're down. We're good to go. And so at that moment, they offered the job. We took the job and then we just started preparing. We made some visits. We, we looked at houses. <laughs> we hired a, a real estate agent. 
We made some trips, and several weeks later, they notified us that they had given the job to someone else. And we were, needless to say, very disappointed. Very disappointed. We were devastated. It was like our world had just crumbled down and fallen apart like there was no hope, there was nowhere to go, there was nothing we could do. And I would even say we were angry. We were angry. You ever been angry before? That something didn't play out the way you thought it was going to play out? Disappointment is inevitable. People will let you down. Circumstances will let you down. We let ourselves down. You ever let yourself down? <laughs> Every day. And sometimes it seems that God lets you down. This isn't a question to raise your hand, but have you ever felt like God let you down? That's what Peter felt when Jesus told him to put that sword away. See, I think this, I think that Peter didn't take the time to pray and to prepare because he thought he had it figured out. He thought, hey, he knew. He was there when, when, when Jesus told Judas that he was gonna deny him and Judas got up from the table and left. He knew that Judas was gonna come back and betray him. He knew that that was gonna happen. I think what Peter did when that happened is he found some time, and this isn't in scripture, this is me just playing it out of my head. I think he found some time to sharpen up that sword and get ready because he thought that Jesus' purpose was to overthrow the Roman Empire, to lead a rebellion and, and set Israel free from Roman oppression. He thought that that's what they had signed up for. He thought that that's what Jesus was gonna do. And what Peter had done is he had constructed, constructed his concept of who Jesus was and Jesus' purpose to fit his own expectations. Peter structured his concept of who Jesus was in order to fit his own expectations. And we do the same thing all the time. We do the same thing all the time. We like to fit the concept of who God is to fit our own expectations of how things should play out and in the right time. And, and we think we know what's best for our lives and we'll sing all day long of God's faithfulness. But then when something doesn't play out the way we think it does, we just fall apart. We just fall apart. We declare that he's our provider and that he gives us everything we need. But then when our bank account runs low, we struggle. God, where are you? What are you doing? And we'll tell God, hey, I'll follow you wherever you call me to. I'll follow you wherever you want me to go as long as I can uh, just live near my family. You know, just make sure it's in this vicinity or make sure I make X amount per year. God doesn't do contract negotiations. <laughs> he doesn't work that way. God does take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me through the highs and through the lows, through the valleys and in the victories. That's what he calls us to. Take up your cross and follow me. See. He doesn't match his plan to meet our preference. He doesn't make his plan to match our preference. See, moving to Charleston was our preference. That's what we wanted. That's what we expected. That's what we thought was best. But thank God that's not what he wanted. Thank God that's not what he wanted. He had a, a higher purpose. He had a greater plan. In the moment, it didn't seem like it, but he did. And thank God we're here today because of it. And sometimes you look backwards and you see that God had a higher plan, a higher purpose, and, but in the moment it doesn't make sense, in the moment it doesn't look like it. But his ways are higher than our ways. 
We like to quote that verse in Isaiah 55. We're gonna put it on the, script, on the screen. But sometimes we fail to keep reading. And I want us to look at this really fast. It says in verse eight, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And typically that's where we end quoting. That's where we kind of stop. But there's more verses that follow. And it says this, because it's a beautiful picture. It says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. The King James says, it will not return void. So just like the snow and the rain fall on the earth before it is evaporated back up into the atmosphere, it does a work under the surface to make the earth bud and flourish. And just like that happens when God's word goes forward and falls on you and me, it will not return to him before it does a work. But that work takes time. And it says this, but his word will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And that's what the Lord is saying. That's not what I am saying. He says, but it will accomplish what God desires and achieve the purpose for which God sent it. It's his purpose. It's his plan. It's what he wants to do, not what you want to happen. And it may seem today that God's let you down. It may seem today that God's disappointed you and failed to meet your expectations. Can I say this? Praise God. Praise God. And I know some people, you're sitting there and you're like, what are you talking about? You don't understand what I'm going through. I know. You're sitting there and you're like, you don't, you don't get it. I need God to take this cancer away. I got too long to live. I want to see my grandkids grow up. I've got things left that I want to do. I need, I need him to take this cancer away. I need that job. You don't get it. I need that job. I need it. But maybe what you need today is to see that God works even in your disappointment. And you have a choice to make when it comes to how you process that disappointment. Are you going to let it paralyze you? Or are you going to let it propel you? Are you going to let it paralyze you or are you going to let it propel you? See, I stand before you because God's plan's greater than mine. And I'm, I'm a living testimony of that. And I like to brag on God a lot because I thought I knew, I thought I knew where I wanted to be and I thought I knew what was best, but God constantly blows me away because he shows me that you don't know what's best. <laughs> what's best is that you just press in and you draw in close to me and I will provide for your every need. It's not always gonna be easy. In fact, it's constantly gonna be hard and there's gonna be things you don't understand, but just stick close. Don't fall prey to the danger of disappointment. Don't put distance between you and I. Even when I, it seems that I've let you down, don't, don't fall away. Don't, don't distance yourself from me because that's what we like to do a lot of times when either uh, God lets us down or a person lets us down or, or whatever it is. Maybe the church lets you down and, and, and you just wanna put distance between you and whatever it is that let you down because you feel safer that way because it's easier that way. But God's saying, don't distance yourself from me. When you go through disappointment, that's when you need to draw in close. See, Jesus wasn't letting Peter down. He was setting Peter up. 
He was setting Peter up. See, like I said, Peter thought he knew what the plan was. He thought he knew what Jesus was trying to accomplish. Again, he thought Jesus had come as he he knew he was the Messiah, but he just misunderstood what the Messiah was. He thought that Jesus was coming just to overthrow the Roman Empire, but Jesus had a higher plan. He had a higher purpose. Jesus didn't want to just meet Peter's expectations. He wanted to exceed them. Because other, rather than just setting Israel free, rather than just doing what Peter wanted to do, Jesus wanted to set the world free. But he knew it was gonna take disappointment. He knew that he was gonna have to let Peter down for a moment in order to accomplish what he really needed to accomplish. And that was to go to the cross. That was to endure the shame. That was to endure the pain of, of that experience in order for all of us, not just for Israel to be free, but every one of us to be free today. That's what Jesus' plan was. That's what his purpose was. And I know it's hard for you to understand and process in the moment, but God's trying to do something in your disappointment. He's not done. He's not done. I want us to think about the story of Lazarus in scripture. We're gonna close with this, but we're just, I think, I want us to paint a picture here for us. And if you're familiar with the Bible, maybe you're familiar with Lazarus. He was the one that died and Jesus resurrected him. But the story started out this way. Jesus got news that Lazarus was sick when he was still alive. And news got to Jesus that he was sick and they had asked for Jesus to come. Jesus was very close friends with Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. They were very close. They were best friends. They, they spent a lot of time together when Jesus was here on earth. And word got to Jesus that, hey, your friend's sick. They're really wanting you to come and, you know, heal him. They had seen him heal so many people. They had seen him do so many wondrous things. And they're like, hey, if there's anybody, if there's anybody that Jesus is gonna listen to and come through for, it's, it's Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And so they sent word for him to come and Jesus gets the, the word and he just takes his time. And then two days after he got the word, he says, all right guys, let's go. And I'm sure everybody was puzzled and confused why did we wait two days? Why did we wait two days? And then on the way, they get news that Lazarus had died. They got word that Lazarus had died. In John chapter 11 and verse 20, I want us to see this because I think this is important. I'm gonna put it up on the screen. Jesus arrives at the house and he's coming down the street And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, this is in verse 20, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Two sisters, two reactions to the same disappointment. I think this is important because Martha drew in. She saw Jesus coming And even in her disappointment, she ran out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. She distanced herself. So Martha comes out and says, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She says, Jesus, I need you to know something. Why didn't you come two days ago? What are you doing? Why didn't you come through when we needed you the most? In our darkest hour, Jesus, I know you love him. I know you love me. If you would have been here, He wouldn't have died. But then there's verse 22. But I know 
I love those three words. But I know, even now, God will give you whatever you ask. <laughs> but I know. Mary's at home. I'm not going to see him. He let me down. Why would I go to see him when he should have been here two days ago? When I needed him the most, when he could have done something about it, Martha says, hey, you stay here, whatever. I'm going to see Jesus. I'm gonna press in. I'm gonna draw close when everyone else draws away. But I no, I love, I love the, the honesty and the sincerity in this moment. She, she doesn't cut straight there. She says, Lord, I need you to know something. I'm disappointed. And that's okay. That's okay to tell God that. Hey, God, I don't, I don't get why you didn't come through. I'm really disappointed. I'm really let down right now. But God's looking for some Marthas today, that in the middle of your disappointment, God, I don't understand why I didn't get that job. God, I don't understand why you let my dad die. God, I don't understand why, insert whatever it is that you expected God to do. But I know, even now, even in the pain, even in the frustration, even in the hurt, even in the disappointment, even in the middle of the letdown. Hey, I know that you're still going to come through. I know and I believe that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. But I know even now you will never leave me. You will never forsake me. Even now I know that you have a plan for my life, that you have a purpose for my life. God, I know. I know it doesn't feel like it. I know it hurts. And I don't understand. But God, I know, even now, you're gonna come through. Let's keep reading. Just bear with me. Verse 38, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. So after he talks to Martha, he says, hey, show me, show me where he is. He came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone. The Lord said, Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor. He stinks. For he has been there four days because you took so long. Because you took so long. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God. Martha didn't say anything else. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out. His hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. There are some of you today, you feel like all hope is lost. You feel like it can't get any worse. And if we were honest today, you would say, my life is like Lazarus and it stinks. It stinks. 
And like Mary and Martha, it seems that God must have better things to do with his time than to come through when you need him the most. But even in the darkness of that tomb, as one of Jesus' closest friends had died, God's plan was still unfolding. Because as as remarkable as it would have been for him to show up and to heal Lazarus, for us to be able to witness him bringing a dead man back to life, glory to God. And some of you today, your life is gonna be a living testimony to God bringing what a lot of people would say is dead and hopeless back to life. Because they look at you and what you're walking through and sometimes people with, sometimes I guess good intentions will try to tell you why you're walking through and facing what you're facing. They'll try to explain it to you. They don't know. (laughs) But God knows, God knows, God knows. Just one last story. I just want to tell you this. When we were in Columbia, I, uh, I worked at a church for several years. And um, it's really where I, I, I've been leading worship and doing music for 20 years or more since high school. God, I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> but when I went to this church, um, there was just a lot of opportunity. I loved the pastor. And our first week there, I went home and I emailed the worship leader and I said, hey, here's, here's who I am, here's what I do. And he quickly emailed me back <laughs> and was like, hey, let's meet for coffee. So we met for coffee. Long story short, he asked me to come and help lead worship and explain to me he was gonna be stepping down. And I was like, sure, this is awesome. I said, this church is going places. We were mobile, just like we're gonna be here soon. We were mobile and um, the worship team was awesome. The musicians were great. The opportunity was great. And I got settled into my new role and then I I was gonna meet the pastor, his name was Jay. I was gonna meet him for coffee one day. We're gonna plan out all these worship sets and everything that was coming up on the calendar and I was super excited. I got there early. I I could see this like it happened yesterday. I showed up at this coffee shop there in Columbia and I had my computer out. You know, I was hip and I was cool and I had my MacBook Pro, you know, and uh, it was tough stuff. And he showed up and when he got there, I was expecting us for us to dive right into this thing. And he didn't even pull his computer out. He sat down and he told me about this church in Charlotte that had approached him about coming to be the pastor there. And he told me he was stepping down. It was like a gut punch. I was like, man, I finally arrived. This is the place we, Christine and I have been praying for. This is an awesome opportunity. There's gonna be so much we're gonna be able to do for the kingdom of God. And man, we were going places. This was, we were growing, people were coming, people were getting saved, people were getting baptized. And, and here's the, the founding pastor. We're two years into being a church and he tells me he's leaving literally like a week or two after I started. I was so disappointed, I was so let down. But he told me this, he said, hey, what I want you to do, and at that point, I was just a volunteer in the church. I was just leading worship because I loved the Lord. I had no desire to be on a staff. I had no desire to do this vocationally. I was still kind of where I started. And I said earlier, I don't want to be a pastor, you know. Um, I just want to help in my church. And he told me, he said, here's what I want you to do. He said, I'm going to have to step down. I'm, you know, going to be gone in a few weeks. He said, but I want you to come on our staff part-time. And I want you to help fill in the gaps. You know, since I'm not gonna be there, the church is gonna need some stability. They're gonna need someone up on the platform that they recognize on a weekly basis. And he says, I need you to step up because I'm stepping down. And I had a choice to make. I had a choice to make. Am I gonna step back because of my disappointment or am I gonna step into it? And I had a choice to make. And I stepped in and God moved and he, he led me 
as I was there, I went part-time on staff, and as I was there, God started to work on my heart, and he led me to pursue this full-time, and that led to us moving to Georgia, and then after moving to Georgia, God led us down here, and I am here today because I stepped in to the disappointment. There's no telling what miracles are in the room today. <laughs> There's no telling the stories we're gonna tell a year, two, five, 10 years from now. And you're in the middle of it right now and it seems like life stinks. But there's no telling the miracle stories that are gonna take place because we take, like that song we sang earlier, we take our wounded expectations and we surrender them to the Lord. Don't step back, step in. Don't step back, step in. Don't fall prey to the danger of disappointment. Don't let your disappointment lead to distance and then your distance to ultimately lead to, lead to denial like Peter did. But if you're there today, and I don't know where everybody is today, Maybe you're disappointed. Maybe you've distanced yourself from God. Maybe you've distanced yourself from somebody else. Or maybe you're at the point and someone dragged you here today and you really didn't want to be here because you thought you had better things to do because you've already given up on God. Maybe you're here today because you're already in that denial stage. God, you let me down one too many times. I don't want anything to do with you. Even if you're there, and here's the good news, and this is what we're gonna talk about next week because we didn't have time today. God gave Peter a do-over. God gave him a do-over. What a beautiful picture. We all face disappointment. We all go through hard times, hard seasons. God's offering you a do-over today. And I don't know where you are today. Let's just close our eyes. Can we just close our eyes in the room today? Just bow your heads, close your eyes. Because God's speaking to somebody today and you face disappointment. Maybe you're here today and you've distanced yourself from God because you've been hurt one too many times. Or like I said, maybe you've walked away or maybe you're here today and you're like, I don't even have a relationship with Jesus. I've never even known what that's like. You can today. And we have people that are ready to talk to you, that are ready to pray with you. After the service, we have a prayer team that meets down front right over here to my right, to your left. And we would love to talk with you and help you process your disappointment. Because God's got something he wants to do with your life. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you never give up on us even when we give up on you. We thank you that you love us, that you went to that cross to pay the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, that we could have a relationship with you. And even though we're in a relationship with you, life's not easy. And at times it stinks. But God, you can resurrect even the deadest of men from the grave and you can resurrect our lives today if we'll just surrender that to you. And so today I pray that you move you speak, that we don't just leave this place and move right along with our life without taking some time to process what you're trying to tell us. And we love you. And this is all for you. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Avalon Church YouTube channel. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision of Avalon Church, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.